Coming up next, Sitting at 30 takes you downtown for the weekly luncheon meeting of the City Club of Portland. Live weekly coverage of City Club is made possible in part by TCI and is produced through the facilities of Portland Cable Access. Now we join the City Club for this week's program. Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to another outstanding City Club program. I'm Francis Storrs, president of the club. Today we focus on the subject of Northwest regionalism as the states of Oregon, Montana, Washington, and Idaho work together on such common issues as energy deregulation, the health rivers and waterways, and protection of fish and salmon runs. Our very special guest today is the Honorable Mark Roscoe, Governor of the State of Montana. I told him that I thought we should welcome him from the land of the big sky to the land of the no sky. <laughs> I do have a couple of announcements. Uh, please join us for City Club's annual meeting and election of officers as well as our program next week, which will feature Mason Druckmann, Wayne Morse biographer. He will discuss Wayne Morse and the myth of maverick ineffectiveness. We return to the Multnomah Athletic Club for this program, so please note that change in location. On Thursday, June 11th, join us for a breakfast program featuring Whitney Harris, the last surviving prosecutor from the Nuremberg Trials. Mr. Harris is the only American attorney to receive the Legion of Merit Award for his services at Nuremberg. This will occur at the Hilton Hotel Ballroom from 7.30 to 9.30. You will need a prepaid reservation and you can get that by calling Winnie Kane at the club office by Tuesday, June 9th. Our board host today is Doug Marker, member of the Board of Governors and Senior Policy Coordinator for Northwest Power Planning Council. He will ask the first question of our speaker. Following Doug's question, we will open the program to all of you in the audience today, members and non-members. We do ask that you ask your questions and limit them to 30 seconds so that they're brief questions rather than statements. Please line up behind the microphone even as Doug is asking his questions so that we can ask as many questions of Governor Roscoe as possible. Broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part because of corporate underwriting from the law firm of Miller, Nash, Wiener and Hager and the U.S. Bank and Legacy Health Systems. We are indeed grateful for their support. Montana's governor, Mark Roscoe, is in his second and final term. His tenure has been associated with the replacement of a $200 million state deficit with a $22 million surplus, which was returned to the taxpayers. He has trimmed state government operations and operates his own office with half the staff it once had. Recently, his successes have caught the attention of his National Republican Party, which featured him in an address at their national convention in 1997, which, for which he received the only standing ovation. Mark Roscoe was born near Libby, Montana, and grew up in Libby, where he led the high school team to its first and only state basketball championship. Unless they won one this year. No, okay. <laughs> His parents served as foster parents to nearly 50 children while he was growing up, and these children joined Mark and his four natural and two adopted brothers and sisters. With practice like that, it's small wonder that Governor Roscoe became student body president at Carroll College in Helena, and then went on to graduate from the University of Montana Law School. After military service in Germany, where he served for three years as chief prosecutor in the Judge Advocate General's Corps, 
He returned to Montana and eventually became special prosecutor as a state assistant attorney general. Two failed attempts to win judgeships didn't daunt him, and he worked nine years as a state prosecutor. He traveled all over his state, winning 95% of his prosecutions, and then he was elected attorney general in 1988 and governor by a narrow margin in 1993. His second term in 1996 was won with 80% of the vote, the largest percentage for any United States governor's race that year. Governor Roscoe is a man who drives his own car, keeps his home phone number listed in the phone book, runs, gardens, and does some carpentry when he can. He still sits on civic boards, United Way and university boards. His wife, Teresa, is also a native Montanan, and their 28-year marriage has resulted in five children, probably lots of other things as well. As a native of Spokane, Washington, I grew up believing that Montana was a mythical place. The trees, my mother would point out, always leapt up 50 feet higher exactly as we crossed the Montana border. Mark Roscoe believes the environment that produced those trees is directly woven into economic and societal issues affecting Montana and this entire region. Please welcome Governor Mark Roscoe as he gives us his perspective on the new Northwest. Thank you, Fran, for that very, very kind introduction. It is genuinely a pleasure to be back here in this place that is rightly recognized for its warm welcomes and its tolerance of visitors. It's gratifying to be here with you today to share some food, and I hope some food for thought, about our nation in general and our unique region in particular as we approach the end of one millennium and the start of a brand new one. I'm happy for the opportunity to come to your beautiful city, especially as you prepare for the Rose Festival. Everyone, even an NBA fan such as myself, knows Portland as the city of roses. I've also heard to it referred as the city of bridges. The bridges on the Columbia, of course, knit Washington and Oregon together. And your impressive bridges on the Willamette unify your own city. To me, bridges convey a sense of welcome a sense of tolerance, a sense of common purpose, qualities that may explain Oregon's tradition of outstanding politicians, moderate but forceful leaders like Tom McCall and Mark Hatfield. The people of the Pacific Northwest are a reflection of so many diverse backgrounds, interests, and beliefs. We come from different corners and cultures to this most unforgettable landscape on Earth. That landscape is itself a mosaic of diversity, from the mountains to the plains, from salt water to high desert, from the towering forest to fields of grain, from the densely populated metropolitan areas to the smallest and most isolated villages. Our region has a rich legacy of producing leaders who can work together with people of different backgrounds, beliefs, and politics to accomplish a better public good. I think of names such as Henry Jackson, Tom Foley, Frank Church, Jim McClure, Dan Evans, and Mike Mansfield. This list should be a point of pride for all of us, and I'm honored to speak at a venue that welcomed these gentlemen in days gone by. These men, effective office holders, were long on performance and short on rhetoric, as it should be. It has become commonplace, sadly in my humble opinion, for public remarks these days to be sharp and pointed, critical and colorful litanies of what is wrong with our society, designed more to be fed to television viewers consuming their meals than for listeners such as this luncheon audience. It is true that one of our democratic society's greatest strengths is a dynamic imperative that requires constantly striving for improvement. Although that is undoubtedly good and necessary, it seems to me we sometimes forget that building a vibrant, 
progressive future, like raising a child, also requires a substantial amount of positive reinforcement and encouragement. If we do not constantly remind ourselves of some of the good things of our nation and region, then we risk losing them, taking them for granted. Let us not forget then the extraordinary blessings of our stubbornly civil society, our tradition of hardworking, conscientious laborers, and our splendid natural environment that attracts millions of visitors and inspires and humbles its full-time residents with daily reminders of how small and fortunate we are in the face of vast natural forces. Now then, before I proceed too far, I of course want to invite all of you to visit Big Sky Country. But in the interest of public safety and your own financial security, I should also warn you that despite what you may have seen or read in the media, in Montana we do have speed limits. So while we do accept Oregon dollars at par in Montana, I hope you will drive reasonably and prudently when you come to visit. Oregon and Montana have much in common. Both states have declined to embrace a sales tax and both states labor to fund corrections and education and universities having to rely on high property and income taxes. Both states are coping with an influx of new arrivals seeking a better quality of life. Both are reconciling increasingly disparate urban and rural viewpoints from different sides of the mountains. And both states need continuing access to Bonneville's bounty of hydropower and its reliable and efficient transmission system. Now, before, never before, has our society, in my view, confronted so many changes and confronted them so rapidly. Each day seems to present an array of monumental events, sometimes shocking change, sometimes disconcerting change, but always, it seems, irreversible change. Indonesia burns and Suharto is gone. The menace of nuclear weapons is loose on the Asian subcontinent. The devastating school tragedies in Springfield and elsewhere across the United States. And of course, all of these things occurring in a matter of weeks. We can sense some disturbing impacts of these changes on our lives and on the lives of our children and our communities as the world gets smaller and more complicated. And I sometimes fear less personal and less civil. I grew up in a large family, as was mentioned, in a small logging town in northwest Montana. I was the oldest of seven children. As I think about it, I guess I'm still the oldest of seven children. <laughs> we had no area codes and zip codes back then, no PIN numbers and cell numbers, no fax numbers nor passwords. Food was not nuked in those days. It was cooked in or on something called an electric stove. A megabyte in our home was understood to be putting too much food in your mouth all at one time. I guess we were somewhat isolated then. Always, always it seemed, nonetheless I felt at home. I can remember when television first entered our modest house on Larch Street in Libby. We were most excited about seeing live pictures from somewhere as far away and as exotic as Spokane, Washington. But at the same time, we shared the same values with our fellow Northwesterners. And our lives were linked across this region in ways large and small. The creek that flows near our family's old house in Libby is called Flower Creek. It empties into the Kootenai River, whose waters flow north through Canada, then back through Idaho and into the Columbia, and eventually past this city on to the Pacific in that wondrous cycle of life of which we are all a part. My father helped survey for some of those dams that now preside over that river and provide power to the region. He coached and I played basketball in a gym lit by VPA power as it still is today. And today my father is buried by one of those lakes where he loved to fish and swim and boat. So, Water is much more than a symbolic link in our region. It sustains us, it nurtures us, and it refreshes our very souls. 
It is an integral and valued part of our lives, economically, recreationally, culturally, and I would suggest to you spiritually. Perhaps more than any other Northwest state, Montana is a place defined by its natural resources. It is called the treasure state, not by mistake. As Lewis and Clark discovered, Montana provides headwaters for two of the world's great rivers, the Missouri flowing east and the Columbia flowing west. Our state is 44th largest in population, but the fourth largest in size, with spectacular scenery and an abundance and diversity of wildlife unsurpassed in the West. In fact, Montana is home today to more species and numbers of wildlife than it was at the turn of the century, an occurrence that came from values held in our hearts and from careful local stewardship, not through dictates issued from distant centers of power and presumed knowledge. We have always understood that these natural resources are limited. We have always understood they must be protected to ensure their survival for future generations to enjoy and appreciate. Montana may not have salmon, but we do have a sincere and heartfelt interest in protecting and restoring fish and wildlife, including salmon. Montana also has an interest in Portland as an access point to tidewater and the world. And we have an interest in the Columbia River as a transportation corridor for our state's products. We know full well that our goods have value only if they can reach the marketplace. As I said, and as Montanans have demonstrated through generations, we care about protecting fish and wildlife. We have our own Montana-based, Columbia Basin species to be concerned about, including bull trout, Kootenai River white sturgeon, and West Slope cutthroat. Each of these creatures is native to the Columbia River Basin. And yet, somehow, in some quarters, there has come to be a perceived primacy, a hierarchy, in which salmon occupy the top spot among threatened species. It seems to me that all of us who care about these issues should care equally about all of God's troubled creatures, whether they occur near or far from large metropolitan centers. And as the temporary stewards of these gifts of nature, we should work to restore these species to the extent we can without harming other lesser known species in the process. Specifically, when the federal government draws down Montana's two Columbia River reservoirs, Lake Kukanusa and Hungry Horse, near Glacier Park, to help juvenile salmon migrate downstream, there is not only a hurtful impact on our fish, we also do not really know whether the higher flows from Montana's waters actually help salmon. That is why I have objected to deep drawdowns. Yet here in the Columbia's lower reaches, Montana's actions to protect its own fish and wildlife, which we see as our duty, are sometimes mistakenly interpreted as an unwillingness to help salmon. That may make a good soundbite, but ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you it is simply not true. Montana is an importantly important watershed for the Columbia. More than 40% of the water stored in the Columbia system on the American side of the border is stored in Montana. As good neighbors, we have made, and we will continue to make, significant contributions to salmon restoration. In fact, Montana contributes almost as much as the other three states combined to augment flows for salmon recovery. Further in this regional context, I'd like to touch on two other topics. The first is whether to breach the four lower Snake River dams. Although I'm certainly not a scientist, I have spent a good many years of my life as a prosecutor. In that line of work, you must prove your case beyond a reasonable doubt. And before those dams are breached and lost as valuable assets, there must be more than sentiment offered as justification. There must, in fact, be strong evidence that breaching would yield a real and a positive return. The second issue is fish and wildlife governance. As some of you may know, I, among others, 
have been frustrated by the current fish and wildlife decision-making structure, which, in practical application, gives the federal government final authority. What I believe the Northwest needs is a different approach, what I call place-based governance. That is, decisions about fish and wildlife in the Columbia River Basin should belong to those who live in the Columbia River Basin. Now that is not exactly radical political thinking in 1998. Basing such important public decisions in the area directly affected, I believe, was the motivation for a certain Tea Party in Boston a couple of hundred years ago. It is the same motive that led Governor Kitzhaber and an army of Oregon interests to devise a recovery plan for Oregon's coastal coho. And it is what the federal government itself has belatedly begun doing with government in the District of Columbia itself. Our region already has a good start on a place-based governance structure in the Northwest Power Planning Council. Its mandate is balance, and it is shared equally by the four states in the region. Plainly said, there are things that the four states can accomplish for their mutual benefits if we act in concert that no one state can accomplish on its own. Most obvious among these is an effective way to decide how to pursue the recovery of our fish and wildlife. I think that Governor Kitzhaber and our colleagues in Idaho and Washington would agree with me. And I think we would also agree that if tribal representation and federal representation and maybe even Canadian representation on the council or a council-like body would improve decision making, then we would view that positively here in this region. Governor Kitzhaber has been a leader in the effort to improve the way decisions are made on the Columbia, and I salute him for his good work. We are blessed in the Northwest to live in one of the most breathtaking natural environments left on Earth. We have vast resources. We have a history of beneficial cooperation. And we have an unavoidable obligation at this moment in our journey to reach an understanding on what the common good is and then to demonstrate the will to pursue it. We need to remember, as we do, the importance of working hard, really listening to each other, and presuming each other's innocence. That can be a formidable challenge in a society where nine-second sound bites and email hearsay can dominate public communications. And we also need to strengthen our working partnerships. The motivation should be clear. Yesterday's margins for air and self-indulgence are gone. They're gone forever. We need to work together. But lest you think this work involves only natural resources, let me say that cooperation like this has provided substantial progress and benefits in our state in areas as diverse as welfare reform, workers' compensation system reform, and even with adoptions. As I mentioned earlier, as was mentioned also by Fran, I come from a large family, six boys and one girl. Our home was so busy and noisy that my mother claims to have absolutely no memory of several years of her life back then. <laughs> as happens in families, not all of us got along all of the time. Those of us who did not usually were the boys. I can remember, as a matter of fact, on the way to church one day when my mother was lecturing me about being the oldest and setting an appropriate example and bemoaning the fact that there was frequent bickering and that I was not contributing to an elimination of this intramural squabbling. And then, of course, uh, she reached into her quiver where she kept all of those emotional arrows and she told me, there may come a day, Mark, when the good Lord takes one of you, and then, then you will be sorry. And I thought to myself, oh, God, I hope it's Larry. <laughs> now, I need to tell you that Larry is fine today. He's the grandfather of four, and of course, we have a rich friendship. Although our parents were not rich in financial terms, they possessed spiritual wealth and they passed it on. They taught us about social obligation, 
Over the years, they took in almost 50 foster children for varying periods of time. And my sister and one brother, Philip, from Korea, were also adopted. As someone with two adopted siblings, I was troubled by the growing list of foster children in our society, spending greater lengths of time in one temporary home after another. So our administration proposed and the legislature approved a streamlining of our adoption laws to facilitate the movement of foster children into the physical, spiritual, and emotional warmth of permanent, loving homes. In conjunction with Catholic Social Services, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, and Wendy's, we developed what we call the Montana Treasure Book, a listing of children with special needs and special challenges currently available for adoption. In a matter of months after that book was first published, I'm delighted to report that nearly 60% of those children were permanently adopted and others are in the works. To our minds, this is the kind of open-minded cooperation that is possible if our desire is actually to get problems solved, rather than merely to continue processing and reprocessing the same difficulties over the years and counting on the public's inattention. We approached our colossal workers' compensation difficulties the same way. A task force of individual Montanans from a wide variety of interests, employers, workers, unions, was appointed. And we asked them to help us develop legislation to really fix the problems. Starting in 1993, our legislature passed and we approved several measures to put that system on a business-like operational basis that not only reduces costs to employers, leaving more money available to invest in new jobs, but also better protects the health and the well-being of more Montana workers. When we took office, our unfunded liabilities had grown to $500 million. We were losing in our system $200,000 a day and had been for 13 years. And the annual operating deficit exceeded $30 million, while premiums continued to climb every single quarter. Today, the annual deficits are gone. In fact, we have a surplus. The unfunded liabilities are gone, too. The anti-fraud unit has saved millions. And this coming July, for the fourth year in a row, premiums again will be reduced, an accumulative total of almost 39%. On welfare reform, we again enlisted a task force consisting of local welfare workers and clients, among many others. We figured if 60 years of old-fashioned welfare had not worked, then probably eight more years of the same wouldn't work either. More than two years ahead of Congress, that group devised what I consider the nation's most far-reaching welfare reform plan. It is not punitive. It was never designed to be. But it does require accountability by all parties. Both the state and the client sign a contract. And each party must perform according to its terms with prescribed benefits and consequences. Now, welfare reform, like many aspects of change, can be very controversial, especially in our society as it emerges. Yet, when these Montana-designed reforms came up before our state legislature, only two votes were cast against them, two votes out of 150. That is the kind of productive progress and social benefit that can be forged if we study hard, listen carefully, and work together. In other ways, we're trying to run government in a more businesslike and reasonable manner. We have helped rewrite and supported a new trial environmental self-audit bill to encourage actual environmental cleanups rather than years of environmental litigation that produced little more than endless announce of newspaper stories about conflict and litigation expenses to accompany them. Our administration believes much more can be accomplished for all sectors, most importantly the environment, through honest ethical partnering instead of repetitive, unproductive confrontations. Our administration has also begun a special initiative aimed at the family. As a father for over 25 years, eventually with five children, and a prosecutor for two decades, I have come to believe that most of our society's serious problems, drugs, crime, you name it, can be traced somehow back to the family, or sadly, in some cases, back to the lack of family. 
Government surely must provide appropriate institutional responses. But government may never be able to catch up with all of the problems caused by malfunctioning families. We can, however, as a caring society and as a caring, responsive government, do something by stressing the positives of families, passing on successful family strategies, and encouraging the majority of American families. We need to stress that while it may not take much effort or thought to make a child, it does take a great deal of thought, effort, and dedication to raise a child. Now, a few other points. In Montana, small business is big business. We are particularly proud of cutting our business equipment tax by 33% in recent years, and we intend to continue that trend. This, along with other reforms in our well-skilled, conscientious labor force, have helped attract some new businesses, such as Advanced Silicon Manufacturing, a branch of Komatsu that will, in a very few days, begin manufacturing polysilicon in Butte, Montana. If any of you are interested, of course, in discussing new economic development opportunities in Montana, we would be delighted to oblige now or later. Our Constitution does not allow government deficits in Montana, which is as it should be in governments as well as in families. Not long ago, when the state ended its fiscal year with a million dollar, multi-million dollar surplus due to efficiencies and a more prosperous economy and tax reforms, we refunded that surplus to the taxpayers because quite simply, it seemed like the right thing to do. No one told us to keep the change, so we didn't. If, as sometimes seems the case in public affairs these days, in this great country of ours, that the only currency is going to be fear or credit, then I'm afraid that real progress of any kind is going to be a scarce commodity. If we only talk at each other instead of to each other, if all we do is exchange rhetorical barbs, then the winner can seem to be the person who shouts the loudest or sounds the most clever on television which seems to me to be done way too much in our public discourse these days. Think for a minute in your own family, if its members communicated with each other through the same kind of snipped sound bites as passed for public dialogue in our society today. I doubt if many here would deem that effective communications, and I doubt if many families would properly function either. Yet that is what we experience every day in this country where talking loudly seems more highly valued than listening carefully. I fear the American people too often see those of us in public office as merely competitors for the next election, not as public servants dedicated to doing things properly during our temporary stewardship of an elected office. In our eagerness to win as candidates and parties, we should not forget that we must also earn the right to serve and that after every election or public debate, we must then all work together for positive solutions and not for position to run for something else. I believe the American people are tired of intramural wars where only divisions are emphasized. We see this coming out of the other Washington every day. There is, in my thinking, no way we are ever going to solve our nation's problems. If all we're made aware of, hour after hour, day after day, week after week, month after month, and year after year, is how different we are. We are, as one precocious Montana eighth grader told me, not different groups of people in America. We are, she said, one group of different Americans. One group of different Americans. A useful thought to savor. We've got problems in this country, along with a lot of very good things. And my suggestion would be that we appreciate what's right together. And we get on about fixing what's wrong together, so that we can get on about building our mutual prosperities together. If we work conscientiously in both the public and the private sector, if we each and every morning vow to do our best to re-earn the trust of the people we work for and with, public or private, throughout that day and the day after, then I believe the future will take care of itself. Of course, there will always be differences of opinion. Montanans, I assure you, are very candid people, just as I believe Oregonians are. 
I get my dose of humility almost every day. As a matter of fact, during my first term, when I had occasion to go to Taco Bell for a couple of tacos after a noontime run, this one small kindergartner came up to me and she pointed at me and she said, you know, I know you. And I would have to confess to you, I was so delighted to think that this small child might have some opportunity or reason to remember me. And I leaned down and I said, you do? And she said, yes, you're Mark Ross Perot. <laughs> but in spite of that humility, and although we sometimes disagree in Montana, we try not to be disagreeable. There are differences of opinion in every family. Larry and I are living proof of that. But we can outgrow our differences, and we simply must not dwell upon them. It is far too easy in our world of instant communications, instant reactions, and instant re-reactions to come to think that there is simply nothing at all that unites us. Many Americans may be silent, but they are rightfully watching those of us in public life. They are judging us. There are enough frightening things going on in our society with economic and generational dislocations that Americans do not want to be further frightened by the constant noise of shallow insults. They want service, and they want to belong, to feel a sense of ownership of their government, their workplace, their employer, their neighborhoods, their democracy. We all want to belong to something good and solid and decent. Trust is earned. It cannot be demanded in a family, a firm, or a government. We are expected to earn that trust by our decisions, by our methods, by our openness, and sometimes even by biting our tongues. Building trust among citizens, employees, voters, family members, any group, is a crucial ingredient to progress. It can be laborious and it can be frustrating. But I must remind you, so is disunity. In the long run, I believe that trust, participation, and the sense of ownership will produce a whole lot more progress than mistrust, isolation, and suspicion. We have more than enough of the latter and not near enough of the former. Thank you. Good day and God bless. Every time I have the opportunity to be the board host, I sit here listening to the speaker and formulating questions in my mind, and no sooner do I do so than the speaker answers him, answers my questions in his speech, <laughs> so I have to quickly make up one. But I do want to come back to the um, argument you made for place-based uh, decision-making as an alternative to just having the federal government um, make the in decisions on natural resource issues in the Northwest, and specifically, um, I, what, I'm, what I'd like you to contrast is um, Given the, uh, at least in Oregon and uh, elsewhere in the Northwest, the partisan divisions over natural resource issues, um, what hope do we have to um, re remove the partisanship from um, natural resource decisions so that they are not lit litmus tests for office holders and not have um, local um, decision making just become a, a re expression of the sagebrush rebellion that we had in the 80s? Well, I think that's a very good question. It's not only relevant here, it's relevant uh, throughout the region and across the United States of America. In my mind, the environment within which uh, public debate occurs on the environment has become polluted. And that is because we don't exercise, first of all, those of us who are involved in public positions, the correct amount of restraint and discipline in our discourse. Uh, the pictures are painted to be ones where there can only be winners and losers. Uh, we don't listen particularly well. We don't study, study hard enough to make certain that we understand all of the facts. And we have competing interests involved that sometimes are inclined only toward winning or losing rather than trying to determine the right thing to do. And clearly, we have had those opportunity to visit those dynamics in the state of Montana as well. So I honestly believe that if we are going to do the kinds of things that are important to all of us as human beings, sharing the same nest, if you will, 
that we simply have to change the way we go about addressing these particular issues. And that means virtually everyone that is involved in the process. I think if this intramural warfare continues in the same vein, under the same terms, that we're going to end up in a process that ultimately damages or injures the environment rather than uh, benefiting it, benefiting it irre irreversibly and almost irretrievably. Uh, the fact of the matter is we shouldn't be making these decisions on the basis of who has the most political juice on a given day. They ought to be made on the basis of what is good and best uh, for the legacy that we have been, had provided to us and that, that we seek to leave behind us. I can tell you plainly as an office holder that there are decisions clearly that might provide more of a searing opportunity uh, to experience the difficult uh, choices that are presented to you. I can think, of course, about things like an execution that is so very personal and so difficult that obviously when it involves a life uh, presents a, an issue that is very, very difficult to deal with. But aside from issues like that, there is no issue that provides more uh, of a higher degree of difficulty than those dealing with the environment, at least for a person occupying a temporary stewardship of an office like I do. And as a consequence of that, uh, knowing that the margins for air continue to shrink, it is something that in our view you have to make certain you're very well informed about and that ultimately makes sense to the people of uh, your individual states in this country. I don't think environmental issues are necessarily partisan issues. I don't think they should be. And I think that if we want to elevate the debate, that those of us in leadership positions have an obligation to make sure that we elevate it first and hope that others will follow behind and that we set a protocol for inquiry that also sets a standard that others can emulate. Club member, is this on? Jay Formick, City Club member. Uh, Governor uh, Ross Perot, uh, <laughs> you touched upon the governance of the Columbia River without referencing the uh, concept of a council of sovereigns. I'm curious, could you share with us what your views are on that concept? Do you support it? Do you think the people of Montana would support a council of sovereigns as a method of managing the Columbia River? You would have to define sovereigns for me. Uh, the, the concept generally calls for representatives on the council from the tribes, the states, the federal government, and variably including uh, representatives from British Columbia. Well, as you know, I'm certain the governors of the Northwest chartered the inquiry that uh, has now been called uh, popularly the Three Sovereigns Process with an intention of bringing about a more collaborative and meaningful decision-making process within the present context that exists, namely the Northwest Power Act. And clearly, we think that that has been a good faith inquiry that may uh, yet yield uh, opportunities for us to bring about in a way that uh, the people of the Northwest and Canada, and certainly that includes our uh, tribal nations, can find acceptable. And we want to continue that process to its logical conclusion. The governors have also decided that on a parallel track and in complementary form that we should be examining other possibilities for governance in the future, which would include investing more credibility and more authority in a body like the Northwest Power Planning Council or the Council, which in my view might be a presumed first option, and that we may even seek to include uh, Canadian representation. Because although we do not hear an urgent plea yet uh, from the Canadians in every venue where we talk about these issues, it is my view that in the not too distant future there going to be very, very concerned in a very intense fashion about virtually everything that occurs up and down the basin, and that as a consequence, if they want to uh, be involved in a way that's meaningful, they may have to look to that entity to be able to participate. So my view is simply that we ought to expand the authority of the council or create a council-like body, that it ought to have tribal representation, it ought to have a Canadian representation, and it ought to be charged and given the responsibility and the authority to deal with these regional issues. I think that kind of place-based governance system would ultimately uh, serve the people of this region and the entire country particularly well. Do you see that replacing the Northwest Power Planning Council? If something like that were to evolve, clearly I don't know that the council would be needed and necessary. I would see it perhaps as the reverse, that the council could evolve into that particular entity. And of course that's not to diminish the Three Sovereigns Inquiry 
which has been undertaken in good faith and which we fully intend to draw to its logical conclusion and which has been very valuable in terms of providing us a sense of direction and understanding of the issues that move all of the disparate interests and also I think is going to present us some options that we can utilize within the present context of what we presently have set by law. Uh, Andrew Wheeler. Governor, I bet you deserve have earned the trust you have from the voters of Montana and uh, I think you are one who deserves to serve. Fran tells me that, um, tells us that you uh, have one more, or you're in your last term. Um, so what are your future plans, politically, if you have some, and then if not, why? <laughs> <laughs> well, you are correct, I am term limited, and to be honest with you, I need to start with a little preface. Uh, Pan Fran pointed out to part of my history, I've not been overwhelmingly and eminently successful with every political endeavor that I have taken up. As a matter of fact, I have been just as unsuccessful as I have been successful. I lost the first three times. She only mentioned two of them charitably and uh, when I ran for judicial office. And I guess I learned a lot about myself and about what the people I live with have in terms of expectations. And it also gave me a tremendous amount of liberty to do what I thought was right because I wasn't afraid of losing. And to be very honest with you, I wasn't supposed to be where I am. This has been a rich blessing and privilege for me to be able to work for the people of Montana for a short period of time in this capacity. I want to, every single day, with the most intensity and the highest degree of urgency I can bring to bear, be the best governor that I can be over the course of the next 30 months. And we have a lot to get accomplished between now and then. And I don't want to, nor do I think it's right for me to contemplate future possibilities because it's a matter of such great disdain to Americans and certainly to Montanans for politicians to be involved in those activities and also because I'm fearful that I'll take my eye off the ball. So the, all of that is to say that it's my firm belief that if I do what I'm supposed to be doing today, tomorrow will take care of itself. And so I don't have any plans about what might occur and I think I have some fairly sound reasons for not planning in any intimate detail. If there is an opportunity where I could be involved in a constructive role and it was within uh, the will of the people that I live with to allow me to do that, I would be again privileged to be able to be involved in that way. But I don't need to hold public office to be personally satisfied, although I feel very lucky that I've been able to. So I'm going to keep my eyes open and my head up uh, and focused and then as things unfold, as life unfolds, I'm sure as it should, I'm sure I'll figure out what to do when the time arrives. Pat Craven, City Club member. I arrived in Portland, Oregon in 1959 from a little town in the northwest corner of North Dakota, 18 miles from your border. But I think the people here today have appreciated your remarks and have a tremendous respect for your record. I wonder if you would have suggestions for state government level people, the governor, the legislator, the Oregon Department of Economic Development, suggestions on how they might spread the rampant in influx of industry to the state of Oregon, which is much of it landing in Portland. We have a density problem that is becoming ridiculous. In my opinion, we're losing a lot of the way of life that I've appreciated here. Would you have any suggestions for what the state could do as contra to city, county who have tax interests and developers and other special interests who would love to have more industry come to Portland? That is a very, very difficult answer to provide, or a very quite difficult question to provide an answer to in all honesty. We are good as human beings in this condition that we share, managing adversity. We're not, however, quite as proficient managing prosperity. And that not only has to do with wealth and development, it has to do probably with our human emotions as well. We have found, of course, in Montana that we have centers of interest where people want and are attracted uh, to develop. And it seems the more prosperity there is, the more that it generates, which I think is a fairly predictable dynamic throughout the course of human history. And it is very difficult as an institutional matter 
to direct uh, without legislation or with legislation how those activities are going to take place because these are products of human choices that are made on the basis of clearly understa understandable criteria. And so I don't know that I have a suggestion for you in that regard, except that what we have tried to do in Montana is to, of course, uh, offer the opportunities for other parts of Montana to be considered in the agenda of activities taking place. We have tried to improve their infrastructure so that they might be prepared and ready for those opportunities when they present themselves. We have tried to steer people in those directions um, through conversation and facts and information being provided to them in a way that allows for competition to occur and for them those developers who are interested to also discover other rich parts uh, within our state. So I don't know that you can direct it institutionally, but I do think as a matter of fairness and good sense that you ought to try to maintain an equilibrium. We try to do that the best we can within the confines of those uh, free market enterprise principles. Keith Kohlberg, City Club member. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering if you could tell me how place-based governance would have worked in the 1960s to solve the segregation and civil rights problem in the South. Well, I'm not altogether certain that it would have, in all honesty. You know, I, I'm not one of those who believes that, that there's not an important role for the federal government to play in our lives. Uh, clearly, I do believe that there is. And I believe that there have been occasions where the rational national perspective has been very important um, to be imposed in certain instances across this country. But I also believe that the presumption should be otherwise and that in the absence of articulable reasons for that to be the dynamic that prevails, that we should in fact depend upon the good sense and the honest purpose of people living in the areas where they live to seek to vindicate their own best interest and the interest of the environment that they share. So I would not deny that there have been instances in our history and in the history of the world where a uh, transcendent view was important to be imposed as a national mandate. But I don't think in this particular case, which frankly I think reflects one of those instances where a national mandate was imposed upon a region, have been altogether fruitful. And I would suggest to you that there are intuitions and thoughts and instincts that well up within the good and decent people of the Pacific Northwest such that they could clearly provide a governance system that would do well by virtually all of God's creatures that happen to inhabit this part of the planet. Matteo Lucio, I'm the managing editor of the Public Affairs Quarterly Oregon's Future. Um, I'm afraid I missed uh, your talk at the Republican National Convention last year. I was wondering, what do you think, besides your personal charm, most attracted the attention of, of that audience uh, in terms of the substance of your politics? I spoke right before lunch. I think, <laughs> I think that was it. I, I would, I'm just, um, I wouldn't know, to be very honest with you. Uh, the, um, the fact is they were very charitable and of course um, they're inclined to be involved in this kind of dialogue and were interested and generous. And I don't know uh, how to answer that question, to be very honest with you. I feel somewhat pretentious trying, so I would be better off to admit to you honestly, as Fran advised me to do, that I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> Traditionally, Oregonians have held an identity that really closely links them to their natural lands, their farmlands, their wetlands, and that has been held throughout the Northwest region. But we've seen in the last decade or so competing interests, competing identities through an emergence of industry and especially the high-tech industry. What do you see as the values in those competing interests and what's your vision of the identity the Northwest region should hold in the decades to come? I think it should hold the same vision of that equilibrium and, uh, and majesty that we have all been so proud of for so many generations. I think, quite frankly, that you cannot diminish one or the other. And you can't foul your nest and expect the species to survive. So it's a given that we have to make certain that this planet is capable of being inhabited and that we are capable of sustaining ourselves over the long run. It's a matter of instinct. I don't believe that that's negotiable. On the other hand, to enjoy it, you have to be able to sustain yourselves. And 
as a consequence of that, I think that there has to be a balance that is meted out in that decision-making process. I know, as you say, that the margins are beginning to escape and that decisions are becoming more difficult. In my view, the principle that we ought to adhere to is the more difficult the problem is, the more we need to talk. I honestly believe that there's not that much distance between people of what might appear to be otherwise disparate philosophies or approaches. That in fact they have the same instinct to survive and that they can understand the thoughts and intuitions of others and that if they deal with each other personally they can come to conclusion about matters that otherwise are difficult to resolve. That doesn't mean that they will be able to solve every single issue in every single dilemma that's presented. But if they can eliminate 90% of the problem through talking, it doesn't take that much farther that, uh, for them to go in order to eliminate all of the issues that are involved. And that's what I think we need to do more of in this country, is rather than competing, we need to make certain that we're acting as uh, statesmen and women. You know, that's really what happened in the summer of 1787. Those people met from June to September and wrote the Constitution of the United States of America, a fairly enduring document. They came there in all sizes and shapes and dispositions, very strong-willed people, but they had a number of goals in mind that they held in common. One of them was to make certain that they chartered this country in an appropriate form. And there were many difficult debates, but they came to conclusion because they knew that if they listened to each other in that hot, steamy room and tried to understand the thoughts of others, that they would be able to come to some uh, thoughtful analysis and resolution that would serve the country well. I think we have to do the same thing, quite frankly. We need to emulate that. And that's going to take some discipline, and it's going to take people who are willing uh, to focus upon the public good rather than the advancement of their own individual careers. Yes, Governor uh, Don Wagner, member of the City Club. Uh, I have a sense of this uh, place-based governance that kind of has a nice ring to it, but could you give a couple of examples where that didn't happen and what went wrong, in other words, where, uh, where you might, might really have, have some, some advantage? Where the, where the, the lack of a place-based yes, governance please. system yes. Yes. has yes. not yes. worked well? Well, I tried to describe one of them briefly in uh, uh, the presentation that I was making, and that I think if you had that sort of a system in place, I'm more than willing to cast my lot with the people of this region, because I know that the dynamics of such an organization would lead them to analyze carefully, to examine intrusively, and then to come to a resolution that had balance because they will implicitly recognize that this is a round world. What goes around comes around. And that if we're going to coexist here in a way that brings about harmony and the possibility of preserving our essence, that we have to be considerate of one another. And we have to make decisions on the basis of sound scientific analysis and with thought and sensitivity toward all of the species that are here and each other. That's what I believe that system would bring. I don't think, for instance, the example I gave you with the deep drawdowns in our state takes into consideration our resident species. Now, did somebody do that evilly or to hurt those species? No. I would never allege that. What I'm saying is that these decisions being made in far distant places where there are huge gaps in culture and knowledge ought to be predictable, that they're not going to be able to preserve the same equilibrium that we could preserve here. That's what I mean to suggest. I just trust the people of this region. I'm willing to saddle up with them and ride through this process because I trust their judgment. And I think everyone else in the country ought to as well. Well, thank you very much, uh, Governor Roscoe, for visiting us uh, from the wonderful state of Montana and speaking to us so uh, candidly and optimistically today. Uh, I was told one other story about Montana when I was a child uh, growing up so close to it in Spokane, that mythical place called Montana. There was a young man who came from Montana and lived in our house, and as I was a child, he told me and my brother that near Bozeman in the winter, it was so cold in this huge, vast state that you could go out in the winter and listen, and what you would hear would be pinging on the ground, ping, ping, ping. And uh, he told us 